بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين ونصلي ونسلم على خاتم النبي نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد We begin in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى and we request praises and blessings upon Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم To my dearest brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته May Allah's peace and blessings may his safety and may his mercy uh, be upon you all and be upon us all and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to accept from us uh, our worship, our fasts, our standing during uh, these blessed nights and all our acts of worship during these blessed days and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with good health and to um, bless us with growth as we uh, progress through the month of Ramadan that our progress constantly uh, grows and we don't retrogress insha'Allah uh, in any capacity as always it's an absolute honor to be uh, with the community uh, in Melbourne uh, some people say subhanallah that I should move to Australia because um, I frequently uh, travel here and um, uh, there's what is lucrative about never-ending flights in economy class uh, all the way uh, to um, uh, you know to far away locations. But subhanAllah, um, I guess over the years, uh, Australia has uh, been, uh, should I say, um, a strong spot, but from the sense of a weak spot personally, because um, every time I do travel here, the communities do make a point of um, highlighting need that um, the communities here are in need of uh, these development programs um, that we run. Um, that have been run during my various travels this year, alhamdulillah. Uh, it's courtesy of um, Melbourne Medina and National Zakat uh, Foundation Australia. Um, in previous years, the uh, previous Melbourne locations, Melbourne Medina uh, locations, um, hosted uh, the Ramadan series uh, that were run. And mashallah, it's, um, I guess, I say strong because um, the communities here are receptive, uh, alhamdulillah, to. Uh, information and to guidance and um, many whom I consider my students have gone on to do some amazing things for the communities here in the forms of madrasas, in the forms of projects. Um, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. So you always feel that even though um, it's a long travel, there's value, there's return on equity. Um, Alhamdulillah, and inshallah, this is the case with other members of the Ummah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in other lands. But the point is that SubhanAllah, the need here is more pronounced than perhaps the need in places in Africa, uh, places um, in Europe. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you all thabat, to give you all steadfastness. I always make a point of uh, mentioning this when I, when I travel down under. Um, and that is that subhanAllah, when I meet the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Australia, be it in Perth, be it uh, in Melbourne, in Sydney, in Brisbane, um, I always feel overwhelmed because I witness firsthand um, the dream of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, in manifestation, right? Because we know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's uh, dream was for Islam to spread through the four uh, corners of the world. Um, if we look at the flat map and the current world listings, we know that Australia uh, is at a corner. Uh, and subhanallah, here I come and I see people holding up uh, La ilaha illallah, the flag of La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, holding up the signpost of taqwa. Uh, you all here coming um, in your numbers despite uh, the nuanced circumstances, especially after COVID and uh, people being far away uh, from the city and Australia having its unique setup in that you have the city and suburbs and people are pretty much uh, disconnected, pretty much far away. Uh, from each other, you all making yourselves present in the different masajid uh, that I visit uh, in Australia. Wallahi, it's heartwarming. You you feel that subhanAllah, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had this dream and he didn't have enough life to see his dream become a reality. But subhanAllah, we are blessed to see each other in different parts of the world. True to la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, a result of his da'wah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, our series this Ramadan is uh, like our series every Ramadan. It has an objective and that objective is obviously development. It's one of transformation. It's one of growing from knowing. It's not enough to just know things. It's not enough to just feel like we um, moving. 
but we're not progressing. And there's always a difference between movement and progress, right? And if you've read previous writings of mine before, I've, I've, I've written on this, that a rocking horse moves, but it doesn't progress. And Ramadan brings about that much needed reflection. It um, calibrates our lives to an extent. It slows us down and it brings us together, which makes these reminders all the more lucrative. These are reminders. What I will share with you, inshallah, you know, but it will make it all the more lucrative. In previous uh, Ramadan series that we've held uh, in Australia um, and that I've held in different parts of the world, it was connected to the seerah. I ran a four season for Ramadan um, uh, series, which was born, subhanAllah, in the, the, uh, the second, the second Melbourne Medina, blast from the past seerah in the 21st uh, century. Uh, we discussed the seerah, uh, but in a manner that mattered in the 21st century. Extracting from the seerah points that were pertinent to you and I living within Muslim minorities today. And that series is up, alhamdulillah, it's online. Uh, you can capture it, you can see the, the, the series we did from the first Medina, and then I ran uh, season two and season three in Asia, and season four, uh, then ran online because it was during COVID and everyone was online. So that was a unique, uh, it was a global kind of uh, season. Uh, we had people from all over the world as opposed to people from a, from a particular place and space and it had uh, its benefits as well. Although, although I always feel that when I'm able to speak to my brothers and sisters in Islam, as, as they say directly, um, whilst we are in each other's presence, there's always greater tarbiyah. Uh, value I can see that you're listening online. We don't know who's you know how people are listening We can see people there, but who knows who's lying on their bed who's wearing a vest instead of a proper shirt Who's maintaining the etiquettes of seeking knowledge? We hear stories as a teacher. I hear stories from my students that oh, you know I was listening to the lesson and I was like this and somebody might have been uh, having his or her pizza on the side uh, or you know, expecting the pizza to be delivered. So they had one ear on the, on, the, on, the, on the lesson and the other ear on the doorbell and Allah didn't place two hearts in the body of a person. So uh, online has its benefits, but it also has its harms. And on site, um, whilst it doesn't allow for the reach, I always feel that subhanAllah, the impact um, is, is greater. For this Ramadan, my dearest uh, brothers and sisters in Islam, we've chosen Surah Yusuf as our base. Previously, we chose the Seerah as our base. We've chosen Surah Yusuf. Uh, as our base, and um, when we ran the seerah, it was a it was a kind of fiqh of seerah. It was a fiqh of seerah in that we weren't storytelling the entire seerah, but we were taking snippets from the seerah and extracting lessons, pondering over them, extracting lessons that are pertinent. And I hope to bring that feel um, here today as well, and in our series this Ramadan, that it won't be a tafsir of Surah Yusuf. If you want that, I taught tafsir of Surah Yusuf in Melbourne over two full days. Uh, at one of your universities here, uh, hosted by Al Kothar Institute, and you can uh, find the entire tafsir uh, online at uh, the Al Kothar uh, online uh, platform. I guess today, given that it's our our first uh, together, um, let's uh, tap into some of the macro um, realities of uh, Surah Yusuf, and I say it's macro because it pertains to uh, every. Uh, surah uh, in the Quran and uh, when we talk about a surah from the surahs of, of the Quran in a, at a macro level then no doubt the first point of discussion will be the Makki versus Madani uh, discussion because when we look into the Quran in some of the Masahif whenever they list the surah name next to the surah there will be this citation Makki and there will be another citation sometimes Madani right and many of us don't ask the question, why uh, are these citations uh, placed? Now, no doubt it's placed as a means of preserving the knowledge of the Quran. Uh, but this is the key point, that this idea of Makki and Madani is from the knowledge of the Quran. And the idea behind it, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, when He revealed the Quran, obviously it was revealed over 23 and a bit years, right? It was not revealed in one chunk. Uh, to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was revealed as one chunk as Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma states from the preserved tablet, the Allah al-Mahfuz to uh, the first heaven, to the house of honor uh, in the first he uh, heaven known as uh, the house of honor, Baytul Izzah, the house of honor. This happened in one chunk 
as per the directive of Ibn Abbas anhuma, and given the nature of this knowledge, the scholars have deduced that he could only have said this if he took it from the Prophet And some people ask this question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ That we revealed the Qur'an on the night of power. And we revealed the Qur'an in Ramadan. But the Qur'an came down over 23 and a bit years. 23 and a half years almost. So how do we marry between this idea and the fact that Allah says it was revealed in one month or in this month and in, in another surah on this night. And the answer to this question uh, comes from the guidance of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Quran as being revealed on the night of decree and power and virtue, Laylatul Qadr, this night that is better than 1000 months, may Allah grant us this night, Ameen. And no doubt this night is a night from the nights of Ramadan, which connects Shahr Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran to inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. It's referring to this revelation from the pre preserved tablet to the house of honor um, in the first um, heaven. However, also there is um, inclusiveness for us to understand that also the first revelation came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the chosen night and during the chosen month. Now, the Quran was revealed over 23 years, which means it was revealed over two periods of the prophetic mission. And we know that the prophetic mission, the da'wah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is divided into two parts. There's the Meccan phase, which was his da'wah before Hijrah to Medina. And then there's the Medinan phase, which was his da'wah after he migrated to Medina. And this is what Makki and Madani refer to. Makki refers to all verses revealed and all surahs revealed before migration to Medina. And Madani refers to all revelation after migration to Medina. Even if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in Mecca, even if he was on Arafah, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا. This verse was revealed when, during which portion? During the Hajj of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We know the Hajj happens in the Meccan region, but it was revealed after Hijrah to Medina. So because it was revealed after Hijrah to Medina, this verse is considered a Madani, a Medinan verse. Now. Is this just the only uh, idea about Makki versus Madari? No, there's more to it, obviously. Because every idea, especially when, it, when, it, when it's an idea from the knowledge of the Sharia, it stems from substantial beginnings. And the scholars discuss this to better understand the wisdoms of the Quran, the lessons of the Quran, the directives of the Quran. Because even in how Allah reveals to us His instructions, and when He reveals to us His instructions, they are lessons. So when the scholars look into the whole Makki, Madani, uh, knowledge genre of Ulum al-Quran, of the sciences of the Quran, they deduce an understanding that when we look at all revelation before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated from Mecca to Medina, pay attention here, don't worry about the cameras, because if I ask you questions and you don't know, when you sat here, then this is like online education. Yani people are not focusing. Allah bless you all. It's the Insta age. It's how it is, isn't it? Dopamine, Insta, distractions, always take us away. Brother Munir, Allah Yahdi. And you don't, don't play with the camera because you will take the attention of my audience. Um, when the scholars look at uh, the whole Makki Madani um, ayat and the genre uh, of ayat, uh, they deduce important lessons and lessons that help us today also in the 21st century. When they look at the verses revealed before the Hijrah of the Prophet wasallam, they note as a general rule, I say general rule because there are some exceptions and Surah Yusuf is from the exceptions. As a general rule, the verses are very short and they're very striking. They're very impactful. They're very direct. And they focus on a finite number of ideas. If you look at every surah in the Quran that is marked as Makki, you will see as a general rule these points that I shared with you. There are some exceptions like Surah Yusuf. Surah Yusuf has longer ayat. Uh, the verses are not striking, they're not so direct, 
but there's a reason because Surah Yusuf is a story. Surah Yusuf is a story. But if you look at all the other Meccan surahs in the Quran, uh, as a general rule, you find that the verses are short. Right? If you look at these Meccan uh, uh, verses, you see that they're short and they're striking. Okay? And you also see that they focus on a finite amount of messages. From them, number one, establishing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the only one worthy of worship. Number two, establishing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the messenger and the one sent by Allah. Number three, establishing belief in the hereafter. Subhanallah. You find this in the, uh, in the, uh, in the Meccan surahs and verses. Number four, good character. Subhanallah. Good character. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا This is a Meccan verse. That Allah has decreed and ruled that you worship no one but one Allah and that you be excellent to your parents. This was revealed in Mecca. Excellence to your parents. What's this got to do with Tawheed? This has got to do with good manners. But good manners is from Tawheed. We find this present in the Meccan verses. How many did we count? Number one, belief in one Allah. Number two, establishing Muhammad as the messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number three, establishing belief in the hereafter. Because the Quraysh denied life after death. And number four, good character. You find this present in the Meccan verses. You don't find riba, interest being haram from the Meccan verses. You don't find uh, Ramadan being Ramadan from the Meccan verses. Zakah being Zakah from the Meccan verses. You don't even find some of the major sins that we know of made impermissible in the Meccan verses, subhanAllah. There's wisdom here. There's wisdom here. Now you got to remember the people receiving the Quran were the Quraysh. And they had hearts and souls shackled in what? In idolatry and idol worship. They had to worship their idols. They had to follow the way of their forefathers. It was running through their veins. Allah says about Banu Israel, They had to worship the calf. Banu Israel had to worship the calf. Even though they saw Allah save them from Fir'aun, they saw the, 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 the sea split, subhanAllah. And you're seeing miracles. You're seeing the sea split. You know this calf and these idols are not doing this. You're seeing Fir'aun being punished and drowned and his people. But after they come out of this circumstance, what's, what do they ask for? After you saw all of this, you're looking to worship an idol? It was running through their veins. When Musa left them and went uh, upon the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his seclusion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he came back to find them what, worshipping? This ijl, they had to worship it. This Quraysh, their hearts, their souls were shackled, shackled in shirk and polytheism and worship and idolatry and idol worship and uh, following the way of their forefathers. So the Quran came to strike this heart, strike the soul. You see, if you have um, a block of ice and you want to create a sculpture from it, do you take a hammer and smash it? You take a chisel and you knock it. You knock it carefully. That way you break away what you don't need and you keep what you need. Subhanallah. And we see this in the Quranic instruction. It came at a time where people's hearts and souls were frozen on idol worship. Allah came with short penetrating ayahs like a chisel. Knock, 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 knock. All these short verses. So it chiseled away what wasn't needed and preserved what was needed. The heart, the fitrah, the soul. Subhanallah. This is from the guidance of the Quran. Also, from the guidance of the Quran, we see here when we separate between the Meccan and the Medina uh, verses, al awlawiyat that the da'wah of the Quran focus on, focuses on looking after the most important priorities before it moves on to the next set of priorities. And that's why the, the Sahaba, they uh, highlighted this from the Ma'isha radiallahu anha and others that if the first verses to come down was leave alcohol, no one would have followed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They would have said, to, you know, you and your message, you can keep it. But a message that conformed to something hidden in them, they were already programmed to worship one Allah. And that message came. It was a reminder. 
And subhanallah, evidence of this is, I mean, today we compare Islamic propagation today to the propagation of the Anbiya alayhim salatu wasalam. How simple was the da'wah of the Anbiya alayhim salatu wasalam? You don't hear all these fancy terms, ontological and empirical and uh, all these uh, fancy terminologies and uh, terminologies that fly over the ears and heads of most people. That's that, the Anbiya alayhim salatu wasalam, they came and said, Allah. Ma lakum min ilahin Worship one Allah, there's no one worthy of worship besides him. All of them. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فَقَالْ يَا قَوْمِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهِ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْرُهُ وَإِلَىٰ عَادٍ أَخَاهُمْ شُعِيبًا قَالْ يَا قَوْمِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهِ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْرُهُ Like this وَإِلَىٰ عَادٍ أَخَاهُمْ هُدَىٰ وَإِلَىٰ مَدْيَنْ أَخَاهُمْ شُعِيبًا Their message was the same Worship one Allah There's no one worthy of worship besides him A simple message Why was it so simple? Because they were coming with a message that was natural to the human being already Allah created us upon a fitra. Fitrat Allah illati fatra nasa alayha. Allah created us upon an instinctive nature and natural disposition to worship one Allah alone. It's within us. It's there. The program is there. The problem is the program got corrupted with a virus. We need an antivirus to remove the virus so that the program can work. The software is there. It's there already. It's just been corrupted. The Anbiya alayhim as salam. They acted in the capacity of an antivirus. Simple. They didn't come to, to program the software. They came to extract the virus that is affecting, polluting, misappropriating, miscalibrating the software that we have. So the Quran came with, with the same message. It came with this chisel and short, penetrative messages establishing Allah as the haqq. Anna Allahu al haqq al mubin Establishing Allah as the haqq. Establishing the messenger as the messenger because if Allah is the haqq, then Allah is just and Allah is merciful. If Allah is just and Allah is merciful, He won't leave mankind. So it makes sense that He sends a messenger, right? And this messenger comes with a book. What's the point of the messenger without a book? Because the messenger is not a reference. He is a, uh, a caller to the reference was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that makes sense as well. So we see the Quran establishing these messages in a collective way, in a measured way, in a scheduled way. Messages that conform to the fitrah that insan has, that we have. And in essence, doing what? Moving away what's not needed and protecting that which is most valuable and that which is needed. In a way, building this ummah, the ummah of da'wah, the first generations of Muslims, the sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een, those women and men, and those men and women who did what? They worked after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, in ensuring his vision became a reality. We are Muslims today because of the da'wah of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een. And don't forget, they were new Muslims. They were new Muslims. Sometimes this is beyond us. The Sahaba were new Muslims, right? Besides those who were born uh, upon Islam, the greatest Sahaba we know, they took the shahada. They entered into Islam. They were new Muslims. And what we see today of almost 2 billion people across the world saying La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah is from the da'wah of new Muslims. For they followed in the footsteps of the ultimate teacher Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what about you and I who are born Muslims, alhamdulillah, who have had the message with us from the time we were born, or at least the majority of us. What responsibility lies on our shoulders towards the next generation and the generations to come? So uh, the Meccan verses, they teach us um, how to be measured, how to be scheduled when developing people, how to focus on, prior, on, on, on the core priorities. There's no point telling people riba is haram if they don't believe in Allah. And we see this in the, in, in the advice of the Prophet wasallam to Mu'ad ibn Jabal when, when the Prophet wasallam sent Mu'ad uh, to, uh, to Yemen as a da'i, as a qadi, uh, as a mufti, subhanallah. He sent him uh, to Yemen to be a judge to be a mufti, to be a caller, a propagator. And he said to Mu'ad, call them to La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And only when they accept it, then call them to salah. And when they accept the salah, then call them to zakah. Subhanallah. Where did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam get this guidance from? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who revealed to him the Quran. That for 13 years, we don't see uh, halal and haram being a major feature of the Qur'an's revelation. 
But after Hijrah to Medina, what happens? The verses become longer. The verses are less striking. The verses are about halal and haram. Do this, don't do that. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَاغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ إِلَى الْمَرَافِقِ وَامْسَحُوا بِرُ You see, long verses. And they're very instructive. Right? If you stand for the salah, then observe the ablution. And Allah is telling you the ablution. How to perform the wudu. We see this in, in, uh, in uh, Medinan verses. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, يَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَذَرُوا مَا بَقِيَ مِنَ الْرِبَى Right? Be God conscious of Allah. Ittaqullah. Wadharu ma baqiya min al-riba. Leave riba. We see riba becoming a major sin in Medina. 13 years after. 13 plus years after the, uh, after the prophetic mission began. After the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called his people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is another benefit uh, for us from this Makkan Madani uh, discussion. So this is our lesson uh, for today. Surah Yusuf. In, at, at the macro level is a surah from the surahs of the Quran and Surah Yusuf is a Meccan uh, surah and uh, we've discussed uh, the functions of Meccan or, or the meaning of Meccan surahs and revelation versus Medinan surahs and revelation and we also discussed some functions just some we didn't discuss all some functions of the Meccan revelation as opposed to the Medinan revelation we discussed the focus of the Meccan revelation and then we have Surah Yusuf. Before we uh, tap into Surah Yusuf, what can we derive from what we've just discussed in terms of our lives today as Muslims in the 21st century? Well, no doubt, this idea of uh, focusing on the most important priorities before uh, the next set of uh, priorities. That's number one. Number two, also how to be appropriate in our da'wah, how we call people, the language we use, the style we use. It's very important, right? Uh, the, from, from, from the pious before us, they used to say, حَدِّثُ النَّاسَ بِمَا بِمَا يَعْرِفُونَ Speak to people with knowledge and in a way uh, that matches their ability to comprehend. Otherwise, they will deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is a benefit for us to take home for those who are fathers here, for those who are mothers here. It's important to raise your kids upon the guidance of the Qur'an. Focus on the most important matters, number one. Number two, Conduct yourself, your speech, your approach, your da'wah, your interaction in a way that is suitable to the child in front of you. A child who is from age uh, 1 to 7 is different to a child who is from age 7 to 14. A child who is uh, from age 14 to 21 is different to a child who is from age 7 to 14. You can't speak to your 21 year old how you speak to your 14 year old or your 7 year old and vice versa. Right? So this is a matter for us to take into consideration that sometimes because of the life of the 21st century, we're busy, we have a lot of work, we double shift, we single shift sometimes, the shift is too long uh, than a normal shift that we might be used to elsewhere. Or if we had a different degree or a different qualification, some people uh, work in a, in, in a laborious way, some people work in an office environment, some people... We all have different things going on and because we become busy and the stresses of life become compounded upon us sometimes we go home and our children do a, a little bit of this and a little bit of that and we snap at them that subhanallah we give them the least patience but we give everything else in life patience and we don't think about how to speak to this child when he or she has this age attached to them and that child and they of this particular age category. So let us uh, take these lessons with us. Obviously, charity begins at home. So we use home as the closest example. Uh, but everywhere in your lives, think about uh, this guidance. In terms of Surah Yusuf, very quickly, uh, it is uh, a Makkan Surah. And it was revealed towards the end of um, uh, the time of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam in Mecca. But it was revealed at subhanallah the most difficult of times and it was revealed before allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, gave uh, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the breathing space he needed and permitted him to um, uh, migrate uh, to medina and set medina as the muslim uh, capital the islamic capital it was revealed subhanallah after the muslims were sanctioned in the Shi'ab of Abi Talib, in the valley of Abi Talib, when, they were, when sanctions, literal sanctions were placed upon them uh, for, for years, no food, no drink, no trade, no medicines. Uh, and, and, and this agreement was hung up on the Kaaba because the Quraysh, in, in all the madness that we read when we learn about Jahiliyyah, they had 
some system, subhanallah. And one of those systems was if something was hung up on the Kaaba, then it, had, it was considered sacred. Yeah, it couldn't be uh, broken. So people honored that contract, subhanallah, and the Muslims went through a severe test. A severe test. Milk in the breast of mothers dried up, subhanallah, because of the lack of nutrition, because of the punishment that was laid upon the Muslims, the siege that was sanctioned upon them. Well, because they said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. They followed a, a man who was from them, whose character was known to them, whose lineage was, was understood by them. They followed this man and subhanallah, uh, the situation and circumstances changed upon them. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to see this. You got to remember, he was a man. He was a human being. He had emotion. He can see uh, babies crying. He can see women worried. He can see the patience of his men. He can see all of this. He's a human being. He feels it. And then subhanallah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes them from that difficulty in that following year, he loses two of his greatest supporters. He loses Abu Talib and he loses Khadija radiallahu anha. Two of his greatest uh, supporters. So subhanallah, you know, we're talking about difficulty after difficulty. And the next set of difficulty you can argue is far greater in terms of intensity than the great intensity of difficulty already experienced because now you've lost your supporters. These people who would push back the onslaught of the Quraysh because of their, 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 their status uh, in society. Right? And then we know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes to Ta'if and he thought he would get some solace there and he would get a better response there. But Subhanallah, he was stoned there and not just stoned, he was humiliated there. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they made the kids come and stone him along with the adults. This is a sign of humiliation when Arabs, uh, they have certain actions that they do. I mean, you probably have understood in recent times that if a slipper is thrown at you or if an Arab picks up a slipper and throws at you, this is a great uh, humiliation, right? This is a great show. You might think it's just a slipper, but in the culture of the Arabs, you, this, you have been humiliated in a great, uh, a great way. So when they brought their kids out to stone the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is a form of uh, grave uh, humiliation. Uh, Subhanallah. And in all this difficulty, the Ummah is going through this, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, reveals uh, Surah Yusuf. And in one reason of revelation, it is said uh, that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in, they, they asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qasasta alayna, if you could uh, tell us uh, some stories. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, nahnu naqussu alayka ahsan al-qasas. We will reveal to you the best of stories. Uh, and this is at the beginning of uh, Surah Yusuf. So this is the reality of Surah Yusuf and when it was revealed and its reason of revelation. And you can see subhanallah that yes, it was the Meccan period, but its verses um, are different to the normative realities of the rest of the Meccan verses that I, I shared with you. But you can see here the eloquence of the Quran. You can see the jazz, miraculous nature of the Quran, that the Quran has um, the system but it also has this flexibility that doesn't take away from its system. And a flexibility that only adds to the value of the Quran. That here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses in this manner that did not take away from the Meccan genre of what uh, the Meccan verses and revelation entail, but in the same breath brought about the necessary impact. And the Quran is that book, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. It's a book that we interact with. Al-Quran ma unzila li kay yuqra'u wa faqat, wa ma unzila li kay yustama'u ilayhi wa faqat, wa ma unzila li kay yuhfadu wa faqat, bal unzila li yaddabbaru ayatihi wa li yatadhakkara ulul albab. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals, right? This Quran wasn't revealed so that you could just read it or so that you could just memorize it or so that you could just listen to it. But rather it was revealed so that you may ponder over its ayat. You may interact with the verses. This is the sunnah of this ummah with their book. And that is why the Quran is the only book that the ummah at large was told to recite. Every other revelation, the ummah at large were not told to recite. It was a book read by the scholars. The Torah was read by the scholars. The Injil was read by the scholars. The Quran was revealed with a command that the masses recite it. Even if you don't understand it. And Allah set a reward for the one who recites it. For every letter you get a hasana. And each hasana is equal to 10 rewards. This is for the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because this is a book that we need to interact with. We need to ponder over. And subhanallah, here comes Surah Yusuf as a means of lifting the hurt 
the pain, the difficulty of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in at that time. That what they're going through, Allah reveals to them that another prophet went through difficulty as well. And not just one, but two, him and his father, Yaqub alayhi salam and Yusuf alayhi salam. And their test was not 10 years, was not 20 years, was not 30 years, was not 40 years. It was northwards of four decades. At conservative estimates, you can say five decades from the time Yusuf was taken away from his home and the time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala united them. What a beautiful patience um, each party needed to have, Yaqub needed to have, and Yusuf needed to have to remain upon the haqq, to remain upon thabat. And that is why we see in Surah Yusuf, فَصَبْرٌ Jamil. This message mentioned a beautiful patient. So Allah reveals it to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to the Sahaba uh, radiallahu anhum ajma'in that they read from this and they take hope that subhanallah, no matter how tough life is, no matter how difficult things are, no matter what challenges in our context the 21st century brings, no matter how many spears are pointed, pointing towards us and how many arrows are directed towards us, we don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowing that whatever Allah does, He only does good. And every day we live, we just have a pixel. And that pixel belongs to a bigger picture that we can't see yet. But we be patient and we grab these pixels and grab these pixels and grab these pixels and we gather these pixels. And the more pixels we gather, things become more clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer until we see one day the ultimate plan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had for us, subhanallah. And then we will look back at our lives and as they say hindsight is twenty twenty. you will look back uh, with full perception and say subhanallah, if I knew then what I knew now, I would have never complained. If I knew then what I know now, I would have asked Allah to, to give me more of these subhanallah tests and difficulties. We don't ask Allah for that, but this is human nature. Hindsight is twenty twenty, and Surah Yusuf is about that. Inshallah, in the upcoming nights as we travel through Surah Yusuf as a base to extract lessons that matter to you and I in the 21st century, this pixel versus picture idea will become more clearer. I love you all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Taqabbal Allah minna wa minkum salih al-a'mal. Hadha wa Allahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them.